Bum 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 All right, all right, all right. You just made your whole computer. I know. I'm sure if Sarah Hare actually watches this, he'll, I hope he has a bedpan next to him so he can throw up into it. This is Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. What big cinematic event is coming, is, is tomorrow? That's funny if you should Guess what, you don't know? No, Brad. The know. movie Dune is, per, is premiering. Oh, the one that has Zendaya and Timothee Chalamet in it? So by the way, I saw the original Dune movie, which was, which was a mixed failure. It, was, it had both great and terrible elements in it in 1981, when most of you were born. Um, and, uh, and, and I fell into love into the Dune world. How many of you have ever read Dune? Any of the Dune books? Are you guys science fiction people? Have you read Asimov's uh, Foundation? I think uh, Apple is doing a, a Foundation series. Anyway, so Dune is premiering. So I used to want to be a Bene Gesserit. That doesn't need anything to do. I passed out a revised schedule of the class because I decided, mes pauvres lapins et lapines, my little bunnies, you are working so hard. You have so much to read, right? So I've decided to move up. Uh, we're going to watch on Monday and Wednesday of next week a really great film. How many of you again have ever read Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities? It's quite moving. And this is a great version of it. It's 1936. It's black and white. And as I have to explain to anyone under the age of 30, I understand it's difficult for you to watch black and white movies because you're so used to CGI and, and, and rich color in front of you that you may not be able to process, there may not be enough pixels for you to process what's happening on the screen. But, and, and, and by the way, this movie is not immediately relevant to our consideration of America or Hamilton, but yet it does a couple of things. Because uh, if you're looking at the notes for today, by the way, here's kind of where we are. Remember, I, I, I've divided Hamilton's life up into four acts. The Revolution, the Constitution, uh, Secretary of Treasury, um, and private citizen, Federalist Party leader, and, uh, and uh, duelist. Um, and, uh, and by the way, just to remind you, right now we're kind of in the middle of Act Two, uh, and I, I further stipulated the scenes of this. And my main purpose today is, yes, on Monday, I introduced you to the Constitutional Convention and the formation of the Constitution. Um, but what I want to talk about today uh, is, is Hamilton's second great role as founder, and that's his theoretical founder, and that's his co-author of the Federalist Papers. More about that in a minute. Um, and, and, uh, it, it, uh, and 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 the the if you, the dates, by the way, which are the transition between this act of Hamilton's life, or essentially 1783. I'll go over those in a minute and again. And and on two, on Thursday. What's the next class meeting? Friday. Friday. Thank you. On Friday, we'll turn to Act Three. Uh, after the Constitution is ratified and, um, and Washington is elected president, as you know, he uh, uh, nominates uh, Hamilton as his Secretary of the Treasury. On the original version of the notes, I made the mistake and put Secretary of State. Who was actually Washington's Secretary of State? Jefferson. And that's when they had the great uh, uh, hip hop battles. Um, so, um, and, and you'll see, by the way, um, uh, so I've decided to move the film ahead because I decided you were doing so much reading and doing so much writing that to give you a little break. Am I not nice? You're so nice. You're so nice. Joe, do you think I'm nice? Yeah. Do you think I'm nice? Okay, good. Um, so, um, anyway, uh, so on Monday and Tuesday we'll watch the film and, and the reason I'm, I'm doing it, and it kind of actually makes it a nice, is what are the major issues in Act Three of Hamilton's life, as you know from the musical and all the documentaries that you've seen? Is once he becomes Secretary of State, these are the major issues: the assumption of the debt of the states and of the, by the way, a good deal of private debt, which saved the nation financially, and the bank bill, the creation of the first bank of the United States. Um, you're going to see that I called Hamilton the theorist of the Constitution in, in uh, three broad ways, as a, as a theorist of constitutional republicanism. And that's what, by the way, to some degree, his great speech at the convention that I had you write on uh, for last night, and his plan of government, 
um, it, it kind of shows that by the time that the Constitutional Convention had come around, both Madison and Hamilton, the two great theorists of the American Constitution and of modern constitutionalism, had, had profoundly rethought the meaning of popular government. More about that in a minute. Um, so uh, in the, the next act of his life, when he becomes Secretary of State, oh, oh, what I was going to say is you're going to see there are also two other dimensions to his, his status as theorist of modern constitutionalism. The great theorist of the modern constitutional executive. And, and uh, the excerpt that I want you to write on for tomorrow night is his essays on the Federalist Papers. I'm going to introduce the Federalist Papers today and, and walk you through them so you get some sense of what they were if you haven't. I know Sammy has had this in American government, and she this has memorized that's, that's all 85 Federalist Papers. Not that, but I was going to say, I definitely have read them. <laughs> Bless your heart. Um, yeah, no, true. But I decided to add to your misery by adding another writing assignment, which is due on Sunday. And that's what? his, yes, I sent it out yesterday. How many of you are reading my emails? You send us so many emails. I, I do not. Yeah, you do. No, I don't. You at least no, I it. don't. <laughs> Now you know what happens when you become senile. Now you know what happens when you become senile. Now you know what happens. Right. Um, so, um, <laughs> um, but he's the, th the third great aspect of modern constitutionalism, and Hamilton is almost single-handedly responsible for, is the theory of modern judicial review. Um, how many of you have ever read Marbury v. Madison or heard of Marbury v. Madison? You know what Marbury v. Madison was? Joe, what was Marbury v. Madison? Anybody? Was it, it was one of the, really the first critical court case in the Supreme Court, yeah. It was like the midnight appointment. Yes, in 1801, actually 1800, 1801, when the Republicans won and swept the Federalists out of office. That's, by the way, in Act 4 of Hamilton's life. Um, then Jefferson appointed, uh, right in the last minute, uh, John Adams appointed a bunch of Federalist judges and everything. And, and so this had to do with the midnight appointment. Marbury v. Madison in 1803 is the first case in which the Supreme Court held that the, that the Supreme Court had judicial review. What's judicial review? What is that power? What is the power of judicial review? What do we mean by that? We'll talk more about this, of course. What is that power, the power of judicial review? Miriam? Yeah, and it's not explicit in the Constitution. It's an implied power. And if you've read Marbury v. Madison, Chief Justice John Marshall's, his, his opinion is taken almost totally from Hamilton's great essay on the judiciary, Federalist 78. So uh, I'll talk more about that today. So um, anyway, um, so what are the great issues that are in Act 3 of Hamilton's life that we'll turn to on Friday and next week? Again, uh, not only is Hamilton one of the great theorists of modern constitutionalism and of the modern executive and the modern judiciary, in some ways, aside from individuals like Adam Smith, uh, and David Hume, who are kind of the founders of modern uh, um, uh, um, capitalist theory, I just blanked on the word, the theory of the modern free economy. Uh, Hamilton in the United States is also one of the great architects of modern finance and uh, the modern capitalistic economy. Um, and by the way, that's the last major aspect of his thinking and writing that we're going to consider in this course. Because as we finish this course, and remember, this is how I planned the course. You know, watched all the videos, uh, uh, read the big book, read some of his essays, and then we're turning back in a couple of weeks to, ha to Miranda's recasting of the play. We'll watch a little bit of the videos again as we move through Miranda's account of how he wrote the play. And if we have time, we're going to act out one of the great plays on Jefferson and Hamilton, written in, in World War II by Sidney Kim, uh, Kingsley, um, uh, called The Patriots, about the great conflict between um, Hamilton and Jefferson. It's an interesting play, and if we have time to do it, we're actually going to act it out. I really love doing that kind of thing. It put, makes students feel uncomfortable and everything, but what the hell, it's my job. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the last book in this class is by an economist historian, John Steele Gordon, Hamilton's Blessing. Um, um, does anyone have the, the uh, chair notebook with you, by the way? I do. Could you pass it down, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mine's brand new, too. So you haven't, there are no markings in it? No, well, not yet, because I don't like marking in it. I take pictures and I Do you want me to autograph it for you once it comes to me? Yes. All right. <laughs> mine is right here. That's oh, I'm sorry, here it is. No, autograph mine. Oh, all right, if you get 
line after right. Give you a pen. Dear Nicole, be sharp. Don't be flat. Be natural. I'll sign it both in English and Hebrew. I'm gonna get that tattoo. Oh, in Chinese. Bo Jie Fu Lao Shi. That's my name. Don't wear it out. Write this down. I admire and love my first um, This is one of the central passages in uh, in Chernow's book, um, and uh, in, in some ways, as you'll see, this passage marks the transition from Act Two of Hamilton's life, founder and designer and theorist of the Constitution, to Act Three, Secretary of Treasury. So, by the way, let me finish about what the main issue there. So, the assumption of the debt. Um, the bank bill, uh, and of course, you know, the great compromise that moves the capital to Washington, D.C., and the great initial foreign policy crises of the Washington administration. In particular, the French Revolution and the continuing war between uh, England and France, which plunged, as you were going to see as we move into this next period, it plunged the United States into the, into the crisis of either taking a side against England and France, and you're going to see, by the way, Washington, by the way, was generally a beloved president. Uh, when he died, uh, and uh, uh, he was generally almost instantly apotheosized, that is to say, turned into a god. But there was one period of Washington's administration in which he was profoundly unpopular, and that was during the French Revolution and the war with England and France. Because, as you're going to uh, I sang about this on, on Monday. Uh, you went for me, my old King Louis. I'm sure that was a... I'll send you the link to the Alan Sherman song so you can listen to it completely. In 1789, of course, with the French Revolution, and, um, and as you're going to see, the, the public pressure, aided by Jefferson, fomented by Jefferson as Washington Secretary of State, to enter the war uh, on the side of France was very intense. And as you're going to see, Washington and Hamilton, under Hamilton's advice, resisted that. And Washington issued what was called the Proclamation of Neutrality. And so there were several great constitutional crises, and that was one of them. And that's, by the way, the context for it's a sale of two tit. <laughs> you finished what you were saying. <laughs> Are you sure you're not singing? you're not saying? No, no. And I didn't even think of that. A tale of two cities. Um, when I was in high school, I read this book, and there was a great movie called Up the Down Staircase about a high school teacher in an in inner city school. And uh, she, she was an English teacher, and she looked at all those textbooks. Do you remember in public school when you had to like sign for your textbooks? Mm -hmm. And of course, you marked them up and, and vandalized them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of the students had rewritten the, the, tic, the title of Dickens's novel from A Tale of Two Cities to A Sale of Two... Say it. Say it. You can't. I can't. I'll get fired. No, you won't. So uh, what I'm going to do is read you a passage, one of the great passages from Chernow's book. This is on page 405. Mark this down. Um, and, and you'll see that this, this passage marks the, the passage between Act 2 of Hamilton's life as constitutional founder and Act 3 as Secretary of State. But this, it's very appropriate. Uh, so this is page 405 of Chernow's book. And, and I remember reading this for the first time and marking it and thinking, someday I'm going to teach a class on this stuff. Political life in the young republic now presented. Class was a fog note. You don't know what it's like to be trapped in this body. Um, political life in the young republic now presented a strange spectacle. The intellectual caliber of the leading figures surpassed that of any future political leadership in American history. On the other hand, their animosity towards one another has seldom been exceeded either. How to explain this mix of elevated thinking and base slander? As mentioned, both sides believed that the future of the country was at stake. By 1792, both political parties saw their opponents as mortal threats to the heritage of the revolution. But the special mixture of idealism and vituperation 
also stem from the experiences of the founders themselves. These selfless warriors of the revolution and sages of the Constitutional Convention had been forced to descend from their Olympian heights and adjust to a rougher world of everyday politics, where they cultivated their own interests and tried to capitalize on their former glory. In consequence, the Founding Fathers all appeared to us in two guises, as both sublime and ordinary, selfless and selfish, heroic and humdrum. After the uh, uh, tenuous unity of 1776, the Revolution, and 1787, the Constitution, they had become wildly competitive and sometimes jealous of one another. It is no accident that our most scathing portraits of them come from their own pens. That paragraph really captures beautifully the irony of the American founding. These giants of revolution, George Washington, and by the way, I will say this, of all the founders, George Washington did seem to kind of stay above the fray and the horror and the mud of everyday politics. But these great individuals of learning, of scholarship, of theory, who, who really created the world's first modern constitution, once they occupied those offices, they became petty and vain and, and, and contentious and partisan. And that's why, in addition to today's partisan politics, which I, as a lifelong student of this country, am sometimes astounded by, the only other decade in our history which looks as horrible as ours is the founding decade. Because the irony is, and we're about to explore some of these institutions, once these great individuals occupied the institutions they designed, they became remarkably petty and tendentious politicians. That's the great irony of the American founding. Um, I, by the way, I would also say that probably only in the Civil War were politics as divisive and, and contentious as they are today and at the founding. All right. So uh, if you're looking at the notes for today, um, again, I just reminded you of the four acts of Hamilton's life. Um, so what I've done is, is I, uh, what the, the subject, uh, if you want, uh, Sammy, I will in fact sign your book afterwards. And anyone else who wants your book autographed for posterity or posterior, um, uh, just let me know. Um, so I've divided Act Two of Hamilton's life into five scenes. Um, the Congress, and don't forget that once the war was over and the Jay Tree and the Treaty of Paris was signed and we had secured our independence, Hamilton was then elected as a delegate to the Articles of Confederation Congress in New York in 1783. And, and that's where he met Madison. So, so interestingly enough, there are three pairs of interaction with Hamilton and, and two, two, uh, three other great p people that you should sort of frames his life. One is Aaron Burr and, and Hamilton. And, and by the way, I have a remark here. Don't forget the personal aspect of Hamilton's life that unfolds during this period. Remember, he gets married. Uh, he meets John Lauren. John Lauren, by the way, is killed. And he's the last casualty, by the way, of the Revolutionary War because he was foraging after the, after the British had surrendered. He, there were still some British troops in South Carolina who was foraging for them, and they shot him. So remember, you remember that from the musical. It's also very poignant in the book, too, when Lawrence is killed. So he marries, Hamilton marries, um, he starts his family, he starts his legal career, and then and we'll come back to his public uh, uh, political career in a minute. Um, but obviously, one pair is Her Aaron Burr and, and uh, Alexander Hamilton. The other one is Hamilton and Jefferson, and the other great pair in his life is Hamilton and Madison. And Hamilton and Madison, um, remember Jefferson during this constitutional period is our ambassador to France. He's not here. Um, uh, he comes back and, and Washington, as you know, appoints him as the Secretary of State. Um, and the irony of American politics is, is, is Hamilton and Madison, as I've already mentioned, are two of the six great founders who are, who are not only great political and practical founders, but as you're going to see, they are the theorists, not only of the Constitution, but of modern constitutionalism. And, um, uh, and the irony is, is they, very, they worked very closely with each other. They first met each other as young delegates to the, Constitutional, to the uh, Articles of Confederation Congress. And you're going to see, it's that experience that almost immediately revealed to them the imbecility and impracticality of the Articles of Confederation. A little bit of which I want to talk about the, the, the theory. And if you have this thing I passed out on, on uh, uh, Monday, the revised regime analysis, 
it, that might be helpful because as a kind of a background, so you might want to pull that out and attach it to your forehead like Indian poker. Um, don't do that. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's scene one. And, and remember, these guys weren't philosophers. Uh, the closest thing to a political philosopher perhaps was Thomas Paine at this time, although all of them had exposure to political philosophy and, and, and political theory. These guys were practical politicians, and it's Hamilton and Madison's experience in the imbecilities of the Congress that almost immediately point them in the direction of the reform of the Constitution. Scene two, which we talked about on Monday, is the Annapolis Convention in September of 1776. After working in Congress, and, and by the way, the, the chair notebook is very good about this. At one point, uh, remember, the Congress was so broke that not only was it not paying its debts to other nations and not paying its debts, uh, uh, or the states for that matter, but whom were they also not paying that almost led to the destruction of the government during this period? I know that's a very broad question. Who won the Revolutionary War? Yeah, the French. Huh? The French. Well, they helped us, those damn French. We did. Uh, pardon me? We did. Who was the leader of the, uh, the commander of the chief? So by the way, all those soldiers fought and died, right? And by the end of the Revolutionary War and the decommissioning of the officers, um, up until about the time of the Constitution, there were about 800 uh, soldiers in the Continental Army. None of them had been paid for more than five years. Now these are the people who had laid down their lives and fought for the, uh, for the cause of the revolution, and the Congress was so broke and couldn't raise money because it had no taxing power that literally, um, if it weren't for Washington, there was actually almost a, re a coup. Uh, and, and you'll see it in, I think it's chapter 10 of, of the chair now. Uh, the disaffected soldiers actually marched on Philadelphia, and Congress had to flee because wouldn't you be pretty pissed if you had fought and died for the revolution, left widows and orphans and, and debts, and you hadn't been paid by your own country? Yeah. But again, it wasn't just a lack of resolve. It showed the institutional in, 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 imbecility of that system of government. And so, that, so remember, the Annapolis Convention, Hamilton and Madison, who had firsthand seen the defects of the articles, tried to get a convention to actually reform the articles. But if you read the articles, I passed them out on Monday and gave you a, if you look at Article 13 of the Articles Confederation, it required unanimity of the states to amend the articles. And you understand, um, I've been married, so I know all about this. Uh, um, if you require unanimity, what is unanimity? What's something unanimous? Or un what, what's unanimity? Everyone agrees on it. That means you've doomed it. And indeed, that meant that the Article of Confederation, as defective as it was, could never be repaired. And that's what the Annapolis Convention was. As I mentioned, it failed. Only five states sent delegates. But again, this is the embryo of the Constitutional Convention. And therefore, it really deserves its own mention as a scene in this part. Now, uh, the part that we covered on Monday and that, that I asked you to write about from his great six-hour speech at the convention, plus his plan of government, um, was uh, the, it, it, from the Constitutional Convention from September on uh, uh, June 18th. There are two more scenes to this part of Hamilton's life, and that's what we're going to cover today is Publius, the writing of the Federalist Papers. Today, the Federalist Papers stands as the authoritative commentary on the United States Constitution. Remember, these were 85 newspaper essays written by Hamilton, Hamilton of the 85 essays, and I'm going to walk you through the outline in a minute. Hamilton wrote about two-thirds of them, uh, and Madison about a third, and then five of them were written by John Jay, who was the preeminent diplomat besides Benjamin Franklin and, and Jefferson of the country at that time. Um, and, um, and you could say, by the way, how do we know that? Because they were published anonymously. First of all, uh, after uh, uh, Hamilton died, Madison then actually tried to stipulate that he had written a certain number of them, but actually, we now know for sure. Anybody know what method we now know? Who wrote what? What do you mean? Pardon me? I can't hear it. No, actually. That was a good guess. Content analysis, computer analysis, word count and everything. In other words, they've gone through, and this isn't just with the Federalist Papers. They can, they can uh, identify the author of any piece of writing, literally by, because you understand, you have a unique voice print, 
and like uh, iris and everything. But it turns out the way you write is also as unique to you as a fingerprint. And that's how we know they've subjected all of the 85 essays, and now they know for sure who wrote which. Does that make sense? Um, all right. So, um, uh, and then uh, the last thing I want to do today, in addition to introducing the Federal's papers, is, is to set up uh, for your second essay, and that is Hamilton's great essay on the presidency, a couple of essays, and more about that in a minute. And then what I just passed out yesterday was your last assignment from this section, which is due Sunday night. And that is Hamilton's great essay on the judiciary and judicial review, Federalist 78. Any comments or questions before we plunge on to this material? Yeah. Uh, Brian. How many things do we have to do Sunday? One. Uh, I, I sent it out yesterday. By the way, remember, everything that I pass out is also posted on Canvas under the files page. So I, what you're supposed to do is read Federalist 78 and respond to those questions. Everyone understand? God bless us. God bless us, everyone. What's that from? Oh, come on, you guys know uh, this. God, yes, Nia, that's right. God bless us, everyone. Who says that? Tiny, Tiny Jim. Jim. Actually, the original quote is, God bless us, everyone. Damn it! All right, so, um, so if you're looking at the notes, um, Oh, by the way, and so the last scene, by the way, that Hamilton plays in the founding, in addition to being the author, of, the primary author, and the, ins the inspiration of the Federal Papers, is he's, he actually has a major role to play in the New York Ratifying Convention, which uh, I, I gave you a little bit of dates there, plus the opening paragraph of the statement of the Ratifying Convention. So um, the Constitution in Article 7 required nine of 13 states and ratifying conventions. For your information, why is that important? We went over this in American government ad nauseum. Um, the Articles of Confederation was a confederation. This is actually important to what we're going to talk about today. What's a confederation? Who are the members? I think I mentioned this when I talked about the UN. And by the way, one of the great transformations of European politics is the development of the European Union, which is not quite a continental government. I, would you agree with that, by the way, Leon? Sorry, I wasn't um, Like everyone else. Um, do your parents vote for members of the European Union, of the, of the yeah. European Parliament? Yeah. So the, the members of every European country actually vote, co the, the, the people vote for representatives of the European Parliament? Not, uh, not, not a lot of people vote. But in other words, it's not just the governments that appoint. Like, again, nobody votes for our UN representatives. Our governments appoint them. So do, do, do people in Europe actually vote for the European Parliament? Yeah. Even if many people don't do it. In other words, it, the, so you actually vote for those people. Me? Well, I, I'm yeah. not sure if you voted for them, but, but the people of each nation actually vote for their representatives in the European Union. That means that the European Union is sort of a halfway point between a continental government and a confederation. So what's a confederation? Who are the members of a confederation? More specifically, the individual states. Or none. So in other words, a confederation is a union of, <coughs> of COVID, get out. No, it's, 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 it's uh, tertiary cephalus. Um, <laughs> if my thumbs start falling off, uh, then you might want to step back. Um, I, I don't have tertiary syphilis, thank you. <laughs> Let it be known that I do not have syphilis. The French disease, la malade française. Not that the French invented it, but um, all right. Uh, um, so, um, uh, the great transition, among other things, between the Articles Confederation and the Constitution was the transition from a confederation to a genuine national government. And that's why, under the Constitution, we actually vote for our representatives to the government. Because anybody know, Sammy should know this, but the rest of you should know this. What are the opening lines of the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. Uh, no, that's not it. <laughs> and my art teacher is exactly, that's all he said. Yeah, the preamble. What's the opening line of the preamble of the United States, you guys? Isn't it, we the people? Yes. In order to form a 
Very good. Nicole, please come to me. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. Um, so understand, the Constitution shifts the members of the union from the sovereign states, the United, yes, we kept the same name, the United States of America. But uh, actually, in reality, the nature of the union shifts from a confederation of sovereign states to a national union of the American people. Um, and, and as you'll see, part of that, the theory that developed that was both Madison and Hamilton. Um, so about the ratification and, and Hamilton's role in it, um, the Articles Confederation required not only unanimity of the state governments, the state legislatures, to change it, to ratify the Articles, which happened on March, I think, uh, 14th, uh, I'm going to turn to the date in 1781, the last year of the war, was also the date in which the, ratification, the Articles were ratified. Um, it required unanimity of all 13 state governments, the state legislatures, because who were the members of the union? The state governments. Does that make sense? No. So. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Bless your heart. You sound like my grandma. I am your grandma. You're not. <laughs> my grandma's dead. Well, what do you think I am? <laughs> Close to dead? Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I <I'm>, think <laughs> I'm alive. I'm alive. It's alive. <sighs> All right, so. Um, uh, where was I? You were about to throw a book at my head. May you borrow your book again? Mm. You want the paper back or the hard copy? <laughs> All right. So, um, the the articles were was a compact or confederation between sovereign states. To ratify them, the state governments had to write them, and also thirteen. And that's why it took so long. The Constitution replaces that with a new method of ratification. First of all, Article 7 says, nine out of 13 states, and ratifying conventions. That is to say, an institution separate from the state government, because the founders did not want the state governments to ratify the Constitution. In my American government class, I talk about the meaning of ratifying convention was, it was like a virtual sampling of popular will short of a popular election. So strictly speaking, we the people in the preamble Every time uh, the ratifying conventions met in the states and ratified. And by the way, the Constitution was finished on September 17th. It was sent back to the Congress, and the Congress sent it out to the states. So by uh, 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 November and December of 1787, uh, Delaware had ratified the Constitution, and Pennsylvania, and then so forth. So there were two states, as this paragraph points out, two states were absolutely central. Even though uh, in Ju June of 1788, the ninth state ratified. And by the way, it was North Carolina, and then they revoked it, and then they ratified it again. And so you'll see that the date of the New York ratifying convention was July 26. So the Constitution technically was already going to go into effect when nine states ratified it. But what were the two critical states uh, necessary to the success of the Union? Because why were these two states so critical to the success of the Constitution and the Union? Population, economy. economy, and geography. Where is New York located? I mean, if you looked at if you looked at the United States, there were three essential regions: New England, the Middle Atlantic states, and the Southern states. And New York, as you know, is the linchpin between the New England states and the uh, Mid Atlantic states. And Virginia is the link between the middle. So if those two states hadn't ratified, it, it literally would have divided up the nation, and we would have had something like so probably that would have something looked more like Europe. So economically, they were the most commercially important states. Population, they were the largest states, and geographically, they were central. So on July 26, Hamilton attended. The, this is his last scene in the act of the Constitution, and he repeated his performance in the Constitutional Convention. The, the Constitution won in the ratifying convention in New York by only three votes. And it looks as if in the same way that Hamilton was central to the Constitutional Convention, he was also central to the ratifying convention. He stood up and spoke for seven to eight hours during that convention. And again, even people who hated Hamilton recognized his energy and his brilliance and his genius. All right. So let's examine now uh, his role as founder by examining the Federalist Papers and by the way, uh, Madison's uh, uh, co-authorship of the book. So if you're looking at the regime analysis, remember, the regime changed. Uh, the, the regime of the United 
colonies changed uh, on July 4th, 1776, with the adoption of the Declaration of Independence, right? In other words, the new ideals of rights and equality became the foundational ideas. The change of the regime from the Articles, on the other hand, to the Constitution, this is how I would describe it, and that's what I tried to uh, 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 draw on a graph. Here's how I would sum it up. The change from the regime of the Articles to the regime of the Constitution, even though the principles on the layer, layer of ideas are the same, is from national, it's from, uh, I'm sorry, I did this fast backwards. Um, a confederal legislative democracy, which is the Articles, to national constitutional republicanism. And that's what you see in Hamilton's great speech that you wrote about and in his plan of government. You can tell, by the way, even if Hamilton thought that his plan was never going to be accepted, it did represent his core ideas, that America is essentially a nation. And so why is it accurate to describe the Articles of Confederation as confederal legislative democracy? Because in that system, where did sovereignty rest? With the states, correct? And then the other thing is that when you looked inside the state governments, almost all of them had separation of powers. Remember, the Articles had no national executive because they were afraid of a king. But it also had no national judiciary either. So the Constitution not only adds a Congress of two houses, it also adds a national executive, more about that in a minute, and a, a, a national a judiciary. But in the state governments, in some ways, the great mistake of the revolution was to think that the people were simply good. Now, you understand, we're about to say something of, of, of critical importance. If human beings are simply good, are you listening? If human beings are simply good, democracy is a good form of government. But if human nature is problematic, first of all, what did we learn from the revolution? A king can be a tyrant. Does everyone understand that? And what we learned from the 11 years between the Revolution and the Constitution was, remember, the king was gotten rid of. And in each state government, the legislature was made supreme. But it turned out, by the way, that a supreme legislature could be just as tyrannical as a king. So the bitter lesson of those 11 years was that a legislature could be tyrannical. In which case, the state governments, which gave all the political power to democratically elect, uh, elected legislatures, that's why the state governments were also tyrannical and impotent and also turbulent. But who elected the state legislatures? The people. So what's the most bitter lesson of the founding period? Not only a king can be tyrannical, not only a legislature or even a judiciary can be tyrannical, who else can be tyrannical? The people. And that's why the great rethinking uh, that's underneath the Constitution is, I know we use the word democratic and democracy very loosely, So, look, if Nancy Pelosi can stand at the podium without a mask, so can I. <laughs> Sounds just like Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> just kidding. All right. So, so, in some ways, the great thinking that's underneath the Constitution, articulated by Hamilton in this great speech, but also Madison, as you're going to see, is in place of a confederal legislative democracy, the Constitution erects what I would call national constitutional republicanism. It's still a popular form of government in the sense that power derives from and eventually is exercised by the people, but not directly. That's what makes a democracy a democracy. And that's why the framers came to the conclusion, strictly speaking, that democracy is a bad form of government. And it's, that's why they shifted in the Constitution to what I would call constitutionalism. A republic, what's the difference, and by the way, you know this because you read Federalist 10. Sure. What's the Wait, actually, I didn't read that one. Well, what's the difference between a democracy and a republic, strictly speaking? Oh, I don't ask me. When I teach this in American government, I use a mnemonic, a memory device. Democracy, direct, republican, or republic, representative. In a republic, the people rule through elected representatives, not directly. And that's a vast improvement in government, according to Madison and Hamilton, etc. So. Let's look at the, uh, uh, so uh, that's what you see in the speech that you read, in Hamilton's great speech. The great defects of the articles wasn't just its confederal nature, it rested too heavily on immediate popular opinion, uh, uh, input. And, and by the way, if you read Federal's 10, which we're going to read a little bit from, from by Madison, it's not just that public opinion is turbulent and ignorant. 
And if you make public policy immediately dependent on public opinion, you're going to have a turbulent, ignorant, and terrible government. How many of you think we should run the government by public opinion poll? I think the government should be run by cats. By cats? Mm -hmm. I agree. I used to be one. Um, then why do you bark? No, seriously. Uh, uh, if you look at public opinion polls, do you notice how quickly they shift? And by the way, do you think people that say only read uh, uh, stuff on the internet or look at YouTube are fit to run the government? That's not to say the people in Congress are fit to run the government either. That's a different issue. But my point here is, is that uh, both Madison and Hamilton came to see, as did all the founders, that a government that was operated directly by public opinion or democratic opinion was not only bad, but let me ask you this. What's the difference between a trial and a lynch mob? And by the way, when you see A Tale of Two Cities on Sunday or Monday, you'll see. What's the difference between a trial and a lynch mob? Due process. People don't think of it this way, but isn't a lynch mob ultimately just as democratic as a trial? Uh, What do I mean by that? Is a lynch mob democratic? Brian? Why? How? And it's majority rule. And there you'll see the core insight of the founders with the problem of democracy. Yes, the people may rule, but if there's no check on the power of the people, like any other institution or human being, if the people have no check on their power, they can be just as monstrous and tyrannical as a dictator or tyrant. Does that make sense? That's the insight that undergirds the Constitution of the United States and all modern constitutionalism. All right, look at the bottom of page one, um, and here's the outline of the Federal Papers, these 85 essays. Like all good papers, it has an introduction and a conclusion. So Federalist 1 and 85 are the um, uh, introduction and conclusions by Hamilton, by the way. So from 2 to 14 is a critique of the Articles of Confederation. That's more or less what you saw in Hamilton's speech at the convention. From 15 to 22 are the defects of the Articles, also continued in his speech. From 23 to 38 are the powers of the new Constitution. And 39 to 46 are why the new Constitution is truly popular Republican and consistent with Federalism. Federalists 47 through 51 uh, are a general introduction to the theory of the Constitution as separation of powers and checks and balances. And then the rest of the Federalist Papers literally follow the institutions of the Constitution. Federalist 52 through 61 is the House, 62 through 66 is the Senate, 67 through 77 are the Presidency, which are worthy, uh, the essays that I asked you to write on for tomorrow are. 78 through 83 of the judiciary, including the Masterpiece 78, that's for next Sunday. And then Federal State 84 is about a Bill of Rights because the original Constitution didn't have a Bill of Rights. And that was one of the great controversies during the ratification struggle. And then 85 is the uh, three. So in the last couple of minutes, uh, a couple of things. What's the purpose of America, according to the Federal Papers? So, uh, Nicole, would you read, please? What's the world, America's world historic purpose, according to Hamilton, in Federalist One? Like, you mean this whole thing? Yep, Federalist One. It has. Okay. Uh, it has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of the country by their conduct and example to decide the important question whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend on their political constitutions on accident and war. So Hamilton is arguing that the choice of the Constitution is not only a choice for the American people, it's a choice for the human race. And there's some truth to this. Never before, perhaps through the formation of the American Constitution during the Revolution, had governments been formed by deliberation and choice. They'd either been imposed upon them by conquerors or tyrants or divine legislators like Moses or Joe Dunn. Um, so, um, Brian, are you, all, are you there? Here's his further take on the world historical purpose of the American people in the Constitution. This is from Federalist 11. The world, this is one of my favorite pa passages, and we'll just stop here, and we'll pick up with this on Friday. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, read. Okay. The world made politically. 
the world may politically as well as geographically be divided into four parts, each having a distinct set of interests. Unhappily for the other three, Europe by her arms and her, by her negotiation, by force and by fraud, has in different degrees extended her dominion over them all. Africa, Asia, and America have su successfully felt her domination. The superiority she has long maintained has tempted her to plume herself as the mistress of the world and to consider the rest of mankind as created for her benefit. Men admired as profound philosophers have, in direct terms, attributed her to her inhabitants of physical superiority and have gravely asserted that all animals and with them the human species degenerate and merit that even dogs cease to bark after having breathed a while in our atmosphere. <laughs> Facts have too long supported these arrogant pretensions. Of Damned the Europeans! Go ahead. It belongs to us to vindicate the honor of the human race and to teach that assuming brother moderation. Union will enable us to do it. This union will add another victim to his triumphs. Let Americans disdain to be the instruments of the European race. Let the 13 states bound together in a strict and indis indissoluble union concur in erecting one great American system, superior to the control of all transatlantic force or influence, and able to dictate the terms of the connection between the old and the new world. So Hamilton sees the transition to the not just as saving the American nation, but in some ways vindicating the Europe, the old human race against European, especially French domination. All right. We'll uh, resume on. Uh, uh, I'll see you in an hour. Bless your heart. Thank you. 